<clears throat> All right. So welcome to our virtual Gallier gathering. We are the Herman Grima and Gallier Historic Houses. I am Dr. Anastasia Scott, Director of Educational Programming. Gallier gatherings are now sponsored by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities Rebirth Grant. Funding for the 2021 Rebirth Grants has been administered by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities and provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the American Rescue Plan and the NEH Sustaining the Humanities through the American Rescue Plan initiative. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Your continued generosity is appreciated. Thank you to those who have made donations and please consider a donation for future virtual lectures. 2021 is our 140th anniversary of the Women's Exchange, our owner and operator of our museums, and the 50th anniversary of the museum. Please join us in celebrating our anniversary by becoming a member. If you are impacted financially by COVID-19, we are offering student membership for $25. If you join now, your membership is good through November, 2022. In his talk, uh, Mr. John E. Hankins um, will talk about the masters of the traditional building arts of New Orleans. So he will provide an overview of the intergenerational transmission of building trade traditions among families and master craftsmen from colonial times till present. Mr. John Ethan Hankins is the founding director of the New Orleans Master Crafts Guild. He previously held the positions of executive director of the New Orleans African American Museum, development director of the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival Foundation, the principal development officer for corporate and community affairs at the New Orleans Museum of Art. Mr. Hankins holds a BA in journalism and advertising and a master's of business administration. He has served on boards of related organizations, including the Louisiana Folklife Commission, Louisiana Landmark Society, and the Preservation Resource Center of New Orleans. So a little bit about uh, Herman Grima for those of you um, who are new to joining us for our virtual lecture series. The Herman Grima and Gallier Historic Houses managed by the Women's Exchange preserves two 19th century French Quarter homes through their architecture, collections, and history, inspires discourse about our collective past, its relevance to our present and future. Visitors, students, and researchers explore such diverse topics as the lives of the house's owners and enslaved people, free people of color, open hearth cooking, morning rituals, and the entrepreneurial pursuits of women. This talk will be recorded and available for viewing in 24 hours on our YouTube channel and website. Please feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you won't miss out on any future recorded programming. If you have questions at any point during the lecture, please save them until the end or you can submit your, your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I present to you, Mr. John Hankins. Good afternoon, everyone. I wanna thank uh, the Herman Grima and Gallia House uh, Museums for inviting me to talk to you about a uh, thing that has come to be the love and uh, focus of my recent activities. 
Uh, from that introduction, you might have ascertained that I am really, really, really old, but uh, still trying to forge ahead and to uh, try to help uh, with what I think is one of the more important aspects of uh, preservation in uh, the French Quarter and New Orleans uh, as a whole. Today, I'm gonna read uh, uh, a little background on the history of uh, the uh, families of master craftsmen, uh, particularly the ones of color in New Orleans and uh, their relevance to uh, the uh, building and sustaining of the historic architecture that the city is uh, famous for. And then um, uh, we'll get my face off the screen and we'll go through a little a few slides and talk about uh, how we are trying to uh, prepare the next generation of master craftsmen in the building trades. So let's get started. Let's get started with a basic question. Who built New Orleans? Uh, New Orleans, as we all will agree, is an architectural masterpiece. From soaring cathedrals to elaborate mansions to basic shotgun houses, the built environment of New Orleans has enchanted residents and visitors from around the world for over three centuries. So who are the carpenters, masons, blacksmiths, and plasterers who built this enchanting place? Historian John Michael Vlach has said of New Orleans' master craftsmen that the features that so delight our eyes flow from skills honed by years of customary practice. What they fashion for us is nothing less than the context of our daily experiences. By creating sturdy structures, building tradesmen provide us with a reassuring context in which subsequent civilizing acts might flourish. Culture commences from the sense of place that flows from their diligent command over mundane materials. But who built it? Who built New Orleans? In 1999, we set out to answer that question when I worked at the New Orleans Museum of Art. What followed were, was three years of oral history research on 55 families of master craftsmen dating back to 1794, who had passed down centuries old, often secret trade skills from one generation to the next. That research resulted in an award-winning uh, exhibition and an award-winning uh, catalog called Raise to the Trade, Creole Building Arts of New Orleans. These families that we researched laid the foundations for the building trades legacies in the black communities of New Orleans. But before I get to our subject today, let me say a word about the highly skilled enslaved black master craftsmen who built so many of the architectural treasures here. Their mastery is evident in structures like the old Ursuline convent in the French Quarter. By the way, we'll have uh, images of uh, many of the buildings that I'm talking about in this part of the talk a little bit later on uh, during the slideshow. Uh, to repeat, their mastery, uh, the mastery of slave enslaved people is evident in structures like the old Ursuline convent in the French Quarter. Completed in 1734, it is the oldest extant building from the French colonial era in the Gulf South. It also exhibits some African stylistic elements in the ironwork that still exists on the building today. Some other great testaments to the skills of enslaved master craftsmen are the buildings around what is now Jackson Square, the Presbytery, uh, the St. Louis Cathedral and the Cabildo, where the landmark Plessy versus Ferguson decision originated in 1892. These icons of New Orleans architectural landscape are a testament to the skills of enslaved master craftsmen. But nearly a century earlier, it was free Black and Creole master builders who established the foundations of the building arts traditions uh, in New Orleans. In historic building contracts, uh, written in French at the time, the term entrepreneur is used to describe the occupations of the known Black and Creole master builders and property developers. In French, an entrepreneur is someone who organizes 
and manages an enterprise, usually with considerable initiative and risk. In antebellum New Orleans, the skill and prestige of master builders and developers was recognized on contracts by the use of the term entrepreneur de Baptiste. I'm not a French speaker. That roughly translates into building contractor today. And there were so many of them. First in the French Quarter, then in Farbourg, Marigny and Tremaine, and then into what is now the Seventh Ward. One of the earliest and most successful was a woman, Rosette Rochon. Born in 1767, Rose Rochon, as she came to be known, came to speculate in real estate in the French Quarter, where she eventually owned rental property, opened grocery stores, made loans, and bought and sold mortgages. Rose became one of the earliest investors in the Farberg Marigny, acquiring the first lot from Bernard de Marigny himself in 1806. When she died in 1863, Rose Rochon left an estate valued at $1 million in present day US currency. Much of the Farberg Marigny was built by free black artisans for French speaking free people of color and Creoles. One of Rose Rochon's neighbors uh, in the Marigny was Jean-Louis Dolio. Jean-Louis and his brother, Joseph, and sisters amassed a family fortune building and selling properties in the French Quarter, the Marigny and Tremaine. Dolio is said to have perfected the Louisiana Creole cottage, including the home that wraps around the curve where Bourbon Street meets Parker Street that is now on the National Register of Historic Places. We'll see a picture of that later. In the 1860 US census, Jean-Louis Dolio's estate was valued at a current $3.23 million. His brother Joseph's estate was valued at a current $3.87 million. One of Dolio's present day descendants, Kevin Dolio, is currently the airport director at Louis Armstrong New Orleans International Airport. Kevin was recently named the 2020 Airport Director of the Year in medium-sized category by the National Trade Journal, Airport Experience News. But back to the early 1800s, a Creole family contemporary to the Dolios was the Suli family. They were even more prolific, acquiring considerable wealth by building and utilizing the properties for speculation and rentals, primarily in the French Quarter. In that same 1860 U.S. census, Bernard Soulier's estate was valued at a present day $6.5 million. African-American scholar Tara Dudley, author of the recently published book, Building Antebellum New Orleans, Free People of Color and Their Influence, has documented over 106 properties, primarily in the French Quarter Marigny and Treme, owned, built, or controlled by just those two Creole families alone, the Suli and Dolio families, between 1820s and 1860. By 1850, almost 64% of the employed free Black males in the Lower South and in New Orleans were artisans, higher than all other major U.S. cities. As for specific building trades, let's go back to the St. Louis Cathedral. The contract to install the black and white checkered center aisle floor was won and installed by Eugene Warburg, a Creole man of color who was born into slavery in New Orleans in 1825, but was later freed by his German father. The self-employed marble cutter was a gifted sculptor too, who received many commissions to create portrait busts, religious statuary and gravestones. However, he moved to Europe in 1853 to escape the increasing racism directed towards artists and artisans of color in New Orleans in the lead up to the Civil War. While researching the apprenticeship records that date back to the early 1800s, they're located by the way in the um, Louisiana collection at the New Orleans Public Library. You'll find that many New Orleans families the names that we all see and hear today uh, learn their trades by apprenticing, apprenticing under established master craftsmen. 
Among the oldest apprenticeship records called indenture records then is that of the Romaine family of Carpenter dating back to 1808. By the way, pretty much the hardest uh, tradesman to find right now is a, a really good historic carpenter. If you know one, you better keep them. Other families uh, of woodworking master craftsmen uh, that we researched included the Bros, the Gaudets, the Gerringers, the Hutchinsons, the Doucettes, whom Sterling Doucette, other people know, and the Plessys. Yes, that's the Homer Plessy family I mentioned earlier. Russell Plessy, by the way, uh, who was the last great master carpenter in the Plessy family, uh, was the, uh, the reason that we named the exhibition Raised to the Trade. When asked uh, why, why he decided to become a carpenter or, or a master carpenter, uh, oh, Mr. Plessy, Mr. Russell said, well, I guess I was raised to that trade. And so that's how we got the name Raised to the Trade. Before that, we were, uh, we had a working title called Working on a Building. I think Raised to the Trade and uh, Mr. Plessy's wisdom is a lot better. Among the prominent families of Brick Mason's research were the Collins family, the Flemings, the Jacksons. Many people know of the 20th century you know of DeSoto Jackson, uh, the Mats, the Paroles, the Reynolds, the Tuckers, and the Pierres. Today, Teddy Pierre Jr., who in, I think, 1970, uh, 1971, he was the third Black graduate of Tulane School of Architecture, but he gave up the practice of architecture and is now uh, one of the foremost historic brick masons in Louisiana. Among iron workers of the 20th century, Donald Tudory and Darrell Reeves stand out from the rest. In fact, Darrell Reeves is perhaps the most highly esteemed historic blacksmith in the Gulf South today. He recently restored all of the ironwork on the fence and gates around Jackson Square, uh, the St. Louis Cathedral, as well as all of the ironwork on the Presbyterian. Darrell is also uh, the headmaster of our ironwork apprenticeship program for the Master Craft Skill. Now, the other big preservation skill, uh, preservation trade uh, that uh, New Orleans is known for is, of course, plastering. New Orleans is known all over the world for its master plasters. Throughout the 20th century, it was said that if you were a plasterer from New Orleans, you could get a job anywhere in America. Among the plastering families research, were the Barthes, who did much of the restoration work on the St. Louis Cathedral, and also who started the um, plastering um, uh, union um, uh, in 94, which was the first, as I think the, uh, we researched the first integrated trade union in the South. Uh, the others were uh, uh, the Castanelles, uh, Herbert Gettridge, uh, who, by the way, uh, after Katrina was the subject of a, a PBS uh, documentary on Frontline. Alan Sumas, who, uh, who was fond of telling me he was the best fisherman in Louisiana, and it's true. Uh, the Vandergrifts and the Porres. Uh, Jeff Porre, whose father, the legendary Calvin Porre, supervised over 300 plasterers for five and a half years to complete the Louisiana Superdome in the 1970s. Jeff Poré is now the plasterer of record who is entrusted to restore and build the most valuable architectural treasures in the Gulf South. Working as independent contractors and subcontractors, Black masters of the building arts were among the first entrepreneurs in the city. They laid the foundation, foundations for the building arts traditions in New Orleans. Those who follow in the traditional building trades today continue to leave their mark upon the city in the face of continuing obstacles, which we can discuss later. We have created the New Orleans Master Crafts Guild to support these independent master craftsmen and to train new generations of apprentices to continue their entrepreneurial legacies in the future. 
Now let's talk a little bit about their work. We can begin the slideshow now. Following uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, what had been two generations of, of, of really a, 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 a serious oppressive uh, damage to the transmission of, of trade skills culminated in uh, many of the families of master craftsmen who many who lived in the Treme, the seventh ward and the ninth ward getting wiped out by Hurricane Katrina. Fortunately for us uh, at Race to the Trade, we had captured their family histories. And so we knew a lot about what they had done, the buildings that they uh, had worked on, uh, the techniques that each family was noted for, and so forth, and that they kept secret from each other, even from people in their own companies. For years after Katrina, uh, many of us, uh, struggled to try to help uh, the remaining uh, master craftsmen who uh, did not pass away uh, or lose all of their tools and lose their homes, try to help them get back on their feet because the city needed it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm fond of saying that the historic architecture of New Orleans doesn't come with, uh, you know, instruction manuals. So, you know, you can't just give uh, uh, instructions to people coming uh, from out of town on how to build and rebuild uh, the historic treasures that we are so known for because those places have been maintained by the very same families for generations, uh, four and five generations, six generations in the cases of uh, the Plessings. So, uh, after a lot of trial and tribulation, I was asked uh, uh, to help found uh, a way to support these craftsmen. And we created the New Orleans Master Craft Skill. The Master Craft Skill, we, uh, there are four basic uh, trade skills, uh, preservation trade skills that were in dire need of support. Uh, they were carpentry, uh, historic carpentry, uh, brick masonry, uh, plastering and ironwork. We assess uh, the situation and concluded that uh, plastering and ironwork, which includes uh, historic welding and blacksmithing or architectural blacksmithing, were the ones in the most dire need. And so we started a training program uh, to uh, create an apprenticeship program for those people uh, to uh, pass along those skills uh, in the ways that their uh, relatives had in the past. So the New Orleans pa Master Crafts Guild was founded in 2012, and it seeks to revive the traditional building trades traditions of New Orleans and to provide apprenticeship training for new generations of master craftsmen. Next slide. By the way, uh, the inspiration for the guild, I uh, came from conversations with uh, uh, Noted folklorist uh, and uh, uh, cultural historian uh, Nick Spitzer uh, from Tulane University, uh, who remarked about how the uh, traditions of brass bands had forged a comeback in New Orleans, primarily by uh, training a new generation, the work of Danny Barker and Tuba Facts, and them, a training in Treme training like younger uh, generations of people uh, in the uh, jazz standards of second line standards. So there you had that generation that came right after uh, the Dirty Dozen Brass Band that included, uh, you know, the formation of Rebirth with, uh, uh, you know, uh, that kind of added, um, shall we say, a, a contemporary twist to the old jazz standards. But they first had to learn the standards before they were uh, allowed, were, were encouraged to progress. In any case, um, uh, uh, to get back to the building trades, we thought that by uh, kind of utilizing uh, that same concept of teaching the old standards while applying it to 
new techniques and new materials would be a way to reinterest the younger generations in uh, to reviving the building trees, much as uh, you know, they successfully uh, revived the brass band traditions in New Orleans, which were dying out uh, in the 70s. So um, uh, with plastering, both uh, interior and exterior, and ironwork, yes, the ironwork slide. Now, uh, it's a lot easier to get people uh, interested in ironwork uh, because of uh, a lot of things. One thing is just the whole fire and flash, it's a lot flashier uh, than plastering. I mean, you got fire going everywhere, it's, you know, it's, it's rhythmic, it's a lot of noise, a lot of fire, and uh, there are a lot of different applications to it. Next slide. Well, uh, when reaching back uh, in history, we had to go back to like a seminal research uh, on ironwork. That was done by uh, Marcus Christian, a historian who was the director of the Negro History Project uh, uh, during uh, right after uh, the WPA, who uh, in uh, uh, who did research for uh, decades uh, and wrote the very first uh, and perhaps the most, still the most exhaustive uh, uh, research on iron workers, blacksmiths primarily uh, in the South. Uh, his book, Negro Iron Workers of Louisiana, 1718 to 1900, is still the definitive text on it. The city of New Orleans, as uh, uh, those quotes are taken from the book, City of New Orleans is justly famous for balcony railings, window grills, fences, and gates, graceful wrought iron tracery and florid cast iron creations are particularly noticeable in the old sections of the city. What few people realize is that a large part of it was hammered out by slaves. Now, that hammered out, go back, that hammered out part uh, is, uh, the part that we recognize as uh, wrought iron or forged iron. New Orleans, along with the cities of Charleston and Savannah, are really very famous for uh, our ironwork. New Orleans more so for cast iron than perhaps our uh, sister cities on the East Coast. But originally, it was the forged iron that gave New Orleans its uh, potential appeal. And the uh, architectural structures that still have uh, wrought iron or forged iron balconies and uh, gates uh, and, um, uh, and so forth are the most treasured to this day. Next slide. I mentioned earlier uh, about uh, the uh, uh, enslaved, uh, the skills of the enslaved uh, people of New Orleans. Um, historian Gwendolyn Midlow Hall, uh, in her revolutionary book, Africans in Louisiana, uh, 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 researched uh, in five different languages and uh, she recorded over 108,000 records of slaves who were brought directly from Africa to Louisiana and was able to illustrate that it was not a random process of, you know, bringing, uh, kidnapping and bringing people in chains to Louisiana. It was in fact that those people, most of those people were brought here because of the skills that they had acquired after, after uh, centuries of training in Africa. This included, uh, Iron workers, we say, like uh, 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 forge iron and blacksmithing uh, is old tradition, metal, uh, metallurgy is an old tradition in Africa, both uh, in terms of, of, of uh, utensils and utilitarian, as well as artistic uh, endeavors. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm proud to have been a part of uh, an exhibition that is now on display at the Gallier House that is called Artistry and Iron that traces the history of blacksmithing from Africa to the French Quarter. But also 
uh, you know, uh, avail, uh, also uh, many of these uh, enslaved people had other skills, both agricultural as well as artistic. A, um, one such person was Eugene Warburg, who was a uh, freed mulatto marble cutter and sculptor who was freed by his German father, but, uh, and became a uh, entrepreneur we spoke about earlier, uh, uh, who, uh, who subsidized his artwork by doing funeral sculptures uh, as well as marble cutting. When the uh, commission was uh, put out for the something distinctive for the center aisle of the uh, St. Louis Cathedral as it was being um, renovated in 1851, Eugene Warburg won that contract and that uh, checkerboard marble um, uh, uh, our way is still in place today and is the most one of the most distinctive aspects of the interior of the St. Louis Cathedral. However, he wanted to be an artist and at that time, uh, you know, uh, even though uh, he was a mulatto that looked very, very white, he uh, was still in Louisiana considered a uh, person of color and therefore, uh, uh, experienced a lot of, um, uh, shall we say, uh, oppressive racism as uh, the city kind of hurtled towards the Civil War. So he moved to Italy and then finally uh, to France. Next slide. Now we mentioned that there were many, many families of, of, of builders who, for the most part, were uh, craftsmen they were primarily kind of carpenters, but they would be what we would now call developers. Uh, the Suli family uh, was probably uh, one of the most prolific. The large slide on your left screen there is a, a townhouse. They were very well known for building uh, Creole townhouses. This is a townhouse that is still standing on uh, North Rampart Street. Uh, contemporary of theirs uh, built. Uh, the house that is at the top right there, Martillo Crusell, that is still one of the largest residences in the French Quarter. It is on Domain Street uh, and uh, it is huge. Uh, three stories, uh, I mean, it's just like huge. And of course, you probably recognize the Sonyat Hotel there, which is right beside uh, the um, Beauregard Kai's house. Uh, which is a house that was built uh, uh, by uh, uh, a uh, contemporary of the Sulis, also called, uh, his name was um, uh, Boadere. And um, he is a gentleman, by the way, he and his son, uh, who show up in the new uh, book on uh, Economy Hall that uh, has just been released. Next slide. This uh, is uh, Jean-Louis Dolio's uh, signature Creole cottage. You recognize it, it's the one that wraps around uh, uh, Bourbon Street, it's like two blocks off Esplanade in the Marigny where Bourbon turns into Barger Street. That roof line is very unique. It has five sides uh, and there are no nails on in that roof line. It is a series of counter lever counter-leveled uh, uh, kind of uh, snap in place of, uh, 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 you know, shingles that to this day has withstood, withstood um, every form of hurricane that Mother Nature has thrown at it since 18, when it was built in 1812. It is on the National uh, Register of Historic Places and has been a residence of many an architect. Uh, um, uh, it uh, uh, is, uh, it was, it has been restored, it is magnificent. Next. As I said before, Daryl Reeves uh, is our, we're gonna talk a little bit about our training in the two uh, trades that we currently offer. 
Daryl Reeves is the master uh, trader in ironwork for the New Orleans uh, Master Crafts Guild. Daryl, uh, by the way, has many, many, many skills. He's a third generation blacksmith. Uh, his shop uh, is in the seventh ward. Um, Daryl calls himself a forensic artistic historic architect. And it's all true. Uh, and uh, he is one of the, uh, uh, he is probably the best known uh, historic blacksmith, architectural blacksmith in the Gulf South. Next. Now, uh, of the different skills uh, that we train our apprentices in, remember I said that these uh, historic places don't come with instruction manuals. So the only people that pretty much are allowed to work on them are people who have worked on them or who uh, know how to work on them by uh, being trained by people who have worked on them before. For instance, you can't go to you know, a technical college at Delgado or, you know, Louisiana Technical College and for anything about working on a building like uh, the Ursuline Convent because the people who are the instructors at those places couldn't, have never worked on any place like that and would never be allowed to work on any place like that. But our apprentices have. For instance, at the Ursuline Convent, uh, Daryl and our apprentices had to replace a chimney, um, uh, uh, like a chimney rod that holds like those historic chimneys in place. Actually, uh, that rod is the one that you see on the large picture uh, on your left. But the chimney that is holding is one well on the back side and not on this front view. But that piece of iron there may be the oldest piece of forged iron in uh, the Gulf South today. So our apprentices learn a lot about materials, both historic as well as present. New iron is so different from anything that uh, existed back then. Darrell says that much of the iron that uh, probably came over in like the 1720s and 1730s was very impure and was probably originally used as ballast in, the, in ships, sailing ships that came over. So that piece of iron there is itself an historic relic. The top uh, image uh, on your right there is a cross that is made from a small piece of, one of that small piece that was taken from that building that had to be discarded. A church that was being restored after Katrina came to Darrow and asked, for, and asked him to design a unique cross for him. Now I said, I have just the idea for you. How about a cross from the oldest religious building in the, Del uh, the Mississippi Delta? So the trick was to design a cross that, uh, without destroying a 275-year-old patina on that iron. That involves teaching apprentices a lot about uh, old iron and the composition of that old iron. And what they did uh, was this kind of modern and old piece that is that circle of, of, of copper on the back, which in and of itself will age and, and, and create its own patina. I think it's just an ingenious uh, solution. But it maintained that old uh, 275, I guess 280 uh, year old um, patina from the original iron. Next. By the way, when would anyone get to work on iron that old? Except in New Orleans, uh, Master Craftsville. In the run up to the tricentennial, uh, Darrell and our apprentices, which you see a couple of them there, uh, were. Uh, uh, commissioned to restore all the ironwork in the Presbyterian. Now, the Presbyterian, you'll recognize these gates on the Presbyterian. They are very interesting. They have been there, you know, the Presbyterian was designed in uh, 1791 to match the Cabildo, which was, you know, uh, built earlier. Uh, by the way, there is a, uh, 
uh, a fence uh, around in the porticos of the presbytery that had been there since it was finished, completed, I think it was like 1806 or something like that. But there never was, had been a gate uh, a fence at the Cabildo. So in the 1990s, uh, uh, after the fire in the roof of the Cabildo, uh, the State Museum put out an F, uh, RFP all over the country for someone to build a gate. They finally got approval to put a gate in, you know, from all the historic people uh, to put fences ar uh, around the Cabildo. Uh, but they wanted one that looked exactly like the one at the Presbyterian. So it went all over the country. And I remember getting a call from uh, a, a friend of mine who uh, is in the park service who worked at their, um, uh, who uh, was at their training school in Colorado. He goes, yo, John, I just got this RFP for looking for a blacksmith uh, to build a fence around the uh, Cabildo. What's wrong with you people down there? You got the man, the best man in the country right there in your backyard. And he was right. And so Darrell was commissioned to build uh, that fence. And that fence was built, uh, Darrell has a way of distressing a brand new iron so that it looks, you know, in this case, 200 years old. And uh, so that fence that you see around the Cabildo uh, was not built in uh, 1790s. It was built in the 1990s by Darrell Reeves. Now, for the presbyter here, uh, those gates are very unique, very sturdy, very heavy uh, uh, problem there. They had last been restored in like the 1930s uh, when um, uh, I guess maybe part of the uh, uh, WPA, but in any case, you can see the frame, and they're very heavy, uh, you know, gates. They are framed in heavy uh, 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 wrought iron. And then there is like a grill that is, that has to be welded into uh, it. Initially, those, uh, the wells were uh, squeezed in there with uh, uh, rope, that had been soaked in tar. That lasted from, you know, 1800 until 1930s or whatever. But from the 1930s until 2018, uh, 2017, they had, done, been, had a lot of damage, especially towards the uh, lower part of it, which all types of nefarious liquids uh, had eaten through uh, all of that stuff had been done there. Darrow had to create a new technique uh, to fuse uh, the grill back into the gates. And uh, so this was a, uh, a way of innovating a new um, material into an old gate. Uh, and uh, welding was, the historic welding was the primary skill that uh, was taught to the apprentices uh, in this shop. And uh, again, uh, where else would you be able to learn uh, how to work on something like that, except uh, with uh, Mr. Reeves. Next slide. The fence around uh, Jackson Square posed a different problem. That fence, as you know, is very heavy, it's very, uh, I mean, it is a monster. It is for the most part, uh, the fence part of it, it is wrought iron or forged iron, but the finials on it are cast iron. Now, when we think of cast iron, we think of all the fancy, frilly, filigree type stuff that you see on the balconies. Uh, picture in your mind, uh, uh, you know, the balconies uh, around the Batalba buildings and stuff like that. That is cast iron, but the cast uh, on top of the fence around Jackson Square pose a different problem. These are very, very, very substantial uh, females. And I mean, they're very, very solid and very, very heavy. So Darrell had to teach, uh, well, he had to cast uh, 
those videos, and in the process taught the apprentices how to cast, uh, you know, substantial, um, you know, uh, uh, cast iron, and then to distress it so that it looks pretty much like the stuff that had been there for oh, almost 200 years. As you can see uh, from the top right side, that is uh, the, um, the wax uh, uh, cast. And then down below, uh, there on the right, you'll see the apprentice. Uh, the apprentice on your left there, Joshua, uh, is learning how to create a sand cast that, uh, uh, that is put in sand right before they pour uh, the molten iron in there. Next slide. Then it has to be installed. Now, uh, the question is, how do you create something that's brand new in 2008 that'll look good on a fence that was almost 200 years old? You don't want to walk by a fence and some of it looks like it came out of Home Depot and some of it looks like it came uh, from antiquity. So the trick here is to not only distress it in the cast, but also to create uh, uh, to weld it uh, into place without showing any welds so that to this day, you could walk with me or by yourself around that gate and you will probably not be able to tell which parts of it was restored and which part of it uh, has been the same for hundreds of years. Next slide. Of course, this all comes together in the more routine work that is done in uh, Dallas Blacksmith Shop, which is a huge shop, it's like 8,000 square feet, uh, on uh, uh, many of the railings and, uh, uh, and fences and gates that you see throughout uh, the French Quarter. Uh, and so this is a combination of both um, historic uh, welding iron welding and uh, castings. You see those finials uh, uh, on the top of uh, the fences are cast on it. So you get a wide range of uh, skills that, that can only be learned by actually working on places like this, because there's nowhere else that you can learn this other than doing it yourself. Next slide. But Darrell also is an artistic uh, uh, blacksmith. And so our apprentices uh, get to learn how to do artistic work too. So, uh, and these are mostly custom jobs that are brought in by architects and uh, property owners. They usually come in and say, we have a, uh, a space, uh, uh, maybe a gate, maybe for a fence, and we need something distinctive there. And for the most part, they'll work with Daryl on uh, a design, which he will hand draw uh, on just paper. I mean, this, uh, I really have a great picture of this one that is just hand drawn by Daryl uh, on paper. But uh, this is the uh, type of work that, um, you know, blacksmiths like to, uh, 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 to say that they get to show off a little bit. Next slide. Uh, this is a detail from that gate. As you can see, the scrolls, the curves, the uh, bends, all this is done by uh, raising bars of steel uh, up to 1900 to 2100 degrees Fahrenheit, and then um, twisting them on jigs while they're hot. Daryl uh, teaches uh, the blacksmiths how to determine by sight uh, the temperature of the uh, of the you know just the red uh, you know uh, temperature of the metal uh, to know when and for how long uh, they can stress it into these shapes. Um, Daryl is fond of adding details like these little uh, gold pieces to it. Do you see the little circles uh, with the wings uh, there uh, below the first set of, uh, of scrolls there? 
that's like a little trickery that they all like uh, to do. But one thing you'll notice about these that uh, blacksmiths that kind of separate uh, true artisans from uh, tradesmen. And that is just how perfect uh, those curves are. There should be no flat parts in the curves. There should be no places where you know where one piece of metal begins and another piece ends. It has to be pleasing to the eye of the master craftsman, or it won't get out of their own shop. Uh, these are the type of, of uh, attention to detail that um, separates uh, a custom-made, hand-wrought, forged iron uh, piece of uh, architectural blacksmithing from the kind of stuff that you would get from a journeyman. Our job is to take someone who is maybe um, has a certificate in welding or something like that, but he wants to do preservation work uh, and teaches them uh, how to uh, be satisfied with nothing less than this level of quality. Next slide. They also learn how to make furniture. Uh, this is a table that was made, uh, custom made again, uh, designed on a piece of paper. I mean, these things are literally almost drawn on napkins. Uh, but uh, uh, the, one of the things that Daryl also teaches the uh, apprentices how to do is how to color the iron. That iron is not painted brass. It is fused brass. It, um, well, I, without you know, getting into Dow's secrets of his trade, but uh, different metals uh, uh, heat up at different temperatures. The base uh, metal for this table is iron, but the color that's on it is copper. Uh, copper uh, melts and you know will just integrate uh, at about half the temperature that um, half that 2100 degrees that uh, that it takes to bend iron. So in order to get this color, you have to know at what temperature, what shade of red hot uh, to infuse copper into that metal. When it dries, it creates its own patina that never has to be painted. Next slide. Dow also works uh, in aluminum. And as you, again, you can see uh, that here's an entirely different metal, entirely different uh, heat points, but uh, the result is the same. Those curves are perfect. Next slide. If any of you have been out to uh, the, uh, uh, the music uh, box uh, village, uh, you'll know that the uh, one of the uh, most popular of their musical architectural structures out there is called the Delphine. This is a collaboration between Daryl and world famous uh, Brooklyn artist Swoon uh, to create uh, from metal uh, a, um, actually this is a wind instrument. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the uh, instruments that is almost always part of any composition out at the Music Box Village. Uh, a lot of tricks uh, to this thing. Um, you know, when approached, uh, when we were approached uh, to collaborate with Swoon to do something in metal, the obvious thing that you would think of would be to create a percussion instrument, right? You got iron work, you think percussion. But thinking out of the box, Swoon was like, ah, oh, that's too easy. Why don't we do a wind instrument? And so we had to create uh, an instrument that would sound like horns uh, and uh, could uh, press compress air uh, through um, horns uh, without, uh, you know, having like to generate, uh, you know, a whole bunch of noise uh, with a compressor. And if you've been there, I won't tell you the secret of how we did it, but if you're there, you'll probably not be able to figure out how it's done, but it's a beautiful piece of work. 
uh, that um, generates wind through all of those uh, handles and um, uh, it's amazing. So he's an artistic uh, blacksmith too, which our um, uh, uh, apprentices learn to work with. Next slide. Uh, Daryl works uh, on one of the largest coal forges uh, in the Gulf South in a shop. He also has a portable coal forge, uh, which he takes out and does demonstrations. You've probably seen him at Jazz Fest and around, uh, as well as he works with, uh, you know, a few uh, 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 forges like you see on TV and, um, you know, the uh, uh, forge and iron show. So they learn how to work on like, you know, the, uh, the fuel forges like uh, they do on TV, uh, make blades or whatever. As a matter of fact, our first apprentice uh, came uh, to us because he wanted to learn how to make blades and he did. Uh, and they also learn how to work on coal forges, which is a, a, a skill that requires, you know, just working. I mean, you have to be able to uh, uh, work with, you know, with, uh, you know, with a lot of different elements to keep that flame at the temperature. But uh, that's the process for doing uh, historic preservation and uh, ironwork, uh, both in well historic welding and blacksmith. Now, uh, the next uh, uh, trade that we do is uh, what we call trial trades. And that is primarily plastering, uh, tile over the tile setting, and brick masonry. Uh, master plasterer Jeff Poray is a fifth generation master plasterer. He and his family have worked on practically every uh, significant building in New Orleans. Certainly in the French Quarter, up and down St. Charles Avenue and in the Garden District. If you want a real tour of uh, historic architecture of New Orleans, sit in the passenger side of Jeff Corey's truck as he drives through the Garden District or uh, St. Charles Avenue or the French Quarter. As he goes, that's my column. We did the ceiling there. We did this. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, if he didn't do it, his father did it, and not his uncle before him. Jeff is one of, I think there are only two left, uh, plaster shops that have a complete art molding studio. That means that if you have a plaster in your house that is broken, or, or uh, I mean, if you just have shreds of it, or even if you only just have pictures of, of, of some plaster that you want restored, uh, the artists in the studio can recreate pretty much anything. They have recreated almost everything uh, that is done in New Orleans. Uh, Jeff is a master of Venetian and specialty finishes of uh, both interior and exterior. He likes to call it uh, smooth as glass finishes. Anybody who's ever seen like one of those finishes, uh, you can't tell it from uh, stone. Uh, and they can do it in all different uh, types and shapes and colors or whatever. It looks make it look like any type of stone. He's a historical restoration specialist, but he also does contemporary works um, and uh, both uh, exterior and uh, interior. Uh, Jeff is, uh, next slide. Jeff is mostly known for supplying uh, the medallions that you find in a lot of the historic homes. He, like Daryl has uh, the molds for pretty much all the finials uh, that you'll see in iron. Uh, Jeff has the uh, molds for pretty much every type of medallion uh, that you can find uh, in uh, New Orleans uh, historic architecture. Uh, and uh, he has samples of them on big boards in his shop. Uh, his shop is like about 15,000 square feet. Uh, and uh, like I said, uh, if you even if you don't know what you want, uh, you can come in and look at some of his samples or look at pictures of stuff that he's done for other people. Or like you see on the left there, if you have parts of something, uh, he can recreate it. Next. Next. 
One of the, uh, you know, when a plasterer gets uh, a particularly uh, uh, special job, they call it a plasterer's paradise. And one such was this Italianate uh, mansion that was uh, built a few years ago in St. Charles Avenue. Uh, both the interior and exterior of this is just a, I mean, plasterers from all over the country will come by to stop by just to watch uh, Jeff and the crew work. We had apprentices to work for about three years uh, on uh, this structure. Next slide. Uh, these are uh, some both interior and exterior uh, shots of it. Uh, you know, the uh, walkways that have growing ceilings, which uh, the owners uh, wanted to replicate the modern versions of what they saw in cathedrals in Italy. And uh, Jeff was able to come up with it and we were able to train uh, apprentices not only how to create those with all the angles involved in it, but also how to create the finishes that would match the uh, uh, limestone. Next slide. That guy in the middle there is in the way uh, in the black shirt. Who has a black shirt to a plaster shop? Me. Uh, but in any case, uh, like I said, uh, we have a uh, uh, Jeff is one. I think there's only one other uh, full uh, molding art molding shop. So uh, from uh, any photograph, part of a, a piece of material, uh, or um, uh, even a blueprint. Uh, Jeff can design and create the mold for it and then train the guys how to do it. And they use the same techniques uh, that have been done for like hundreds of years. Next slide. A lot of this is hand work. Those uh, moldings that you see there, uh, you know, they're not just kind of rolled into some uh, assembly line and come out the other way. Uh, you have to feel uh, uh, the plaster and know uh, the right consistency by feel. Next. Again, exterior work poses like whole different uh, types of uh, challenges. Um, you know, uh, uh, you'll notice that all the plasterers, the master plasterers are wearing white. Uh, they pride themselves in uh, coming to work. Uh, completely clean and white, and leaving at the end of the day in white. In order to drill that home, the apprentices, which you see on the right of the screen, uh, have to wear dark colors. And uh, it is a challenge to learn how to end the day with that, uh, with those, uh, with their work clothes looking um, still black at the end of the day. But here uh, you see uh, they're working on the bandstand at um, City Park. You know, as much as uh, Jeff is known for uh, doing those uh, great embellished uh, work, you know, the real skill of the uh, plasterer are in like real cool, perfect walls that, that almost defy, um, uh, you know, uh, any scrutiny. I mean, they just look like they're in place. And so um, well, one of uh, Jeff's, uh, um, you know, most uh, prized jobs is in uh, Gallia Hall, which he's the artist that uh, plaster they always call on. If you walk in any of the rooms of Gallia Hall, the plaster there is so perfect. Uh, it just looks like it should have always been there. Next. Again, uh, you know, uh, our object is to create an environment in which what is old uh, can be preserved uh, in the city of New Orleans. And we teach the, the, the skills to people on how to maintain these structures. Next slide. And uh, now, uh, if you have any questions that don't stump uh, the speaker, I'll be glad to take them. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Wow, that was amazing. Um, I just have a few announcements. 
So um, since um, we'd like to acknowledge us rescheduling uh, this event, because um, it was, a, of course, originally scheduled for September 8th, uh, some of those links broke when we rescheduled it from September 8th to November the 11th. So some of you who originally um, registered for these events, I'm so sorry um, that you weren't able to join us on this evening. But of course, um, as I've said before, this event will be recorded um, and posted to our website and um, our YouTube channel. So I'm so sorry that some of you weren't able to access it due to some of the links breaking. Another reminder, thank you, John, for mentioning it during your uh, presentation that we do have our latest um, exhibition called Artistry in Iron that is at Gallier House. So um, please do uh, visit Gallier House. After Gallier House, the exhibit will be traveling to the Nor Nav Navra and uh, New Orleans East location um, after um, Gallier House. So please um, look for that um, at the NOPL site and of course um, at the uh, Herman Grima and Gallery Historic Houses site. So we'll start with some questions. Um, first questions, um, is cast iron solid pieces? What is the hollow type of iron pieces called? Yeah, for the most part, uh, the hollow iron that you see on balcony railings is cast iron. Uh, it became very popular in New Orleans uh, after around the 1850s, primarily after uh, the Countess from Talba uh, put uh, all of that fancy uh, cast iron around the Patalba buildings. Where you had people who had really, really, really expensive and good wrought iron, they pulled it out and put cast iron. Now cast iron is hollow, is brittle, it breaks. And uh, you might notice that uh, oftentimes it is not as durable as uh, forged iron or wrought iron. Um, and so uh, that's kind of the distinction. However, on the finials that you see in a lot of the older uh, gates and uh, like around the French, uh, around Jackson Square. A lot of the gates that you see on uh, the older properties in the city, those are also cast, but they are solid cast. The kind of thing that Daryl does, they are solid cast. So for instance, uh, those finials on the uh, fence and gates around uh, the Jackson Square, those things weigh like five or six pounds a piece. I mean, they're heavy. Thank you. Next question comes from a woman who um, comes from a long line of master carpenters. Her question is, are there any women plasterer or women in the, the apprenticeship uh, program? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, after uh, 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 COVID-19, uh, our funding got cut back because you know we pay our apprentices uh, kind of, you know, just a, uh, a working wage. Uh, it costs about $25,000 uh, per year uh, plus benefits uh, to, uh, it's $25,000 to us to pay an apprentice to learn these trades. So uh, it's an expensive proposition. A lot of the funding dried up, uh, but the, uh, so uh, there are only two apprentices now uh, in the iron working career. And one of them is a woman. And she is very good. As a matter of fact, she came here from New Orleans because she saw our website and the videos on our website and came here and wanted to learn how to become uh, a blacksmith, uh, an architectural blacksmith. Wow. Now, in plastering is a different story. Um, women have not fared too well in plastering because the work uh, is harder. I mean, it's just heavier uh, and harder. Uh, the Barthes uh, plastering uh, company, uh, Mr. Earl Barthes, who was legendary, when he passed away, his daughters uh, ran his business and were the best plasters in his shop. But um, uh, plastering is a very uh, demanding uh, trade. And so um, 
It's not that women can't do it, but um, we just uh, we haven't been successful in uh, placing women uh, in plastering. Thank you. Next question. What are the shingles made of on the house on uh, Prager? A slate. Uh, and they have a hook. I don't know if you can see my hand, but it's like it kind of hooks like that, and they kind of like just grab underneath each other. And so the slate. Uh, tell you what, if you um, look, if you go to the uh, National Registry of Historic Places and look up that house. I'll give you the address. Um, they have a diagram of that roof. Actually, I have a diagram of that roof here. I might be able to find it and show you. I'm gonna place it up here. Is you? Can you all see that? Kind of. A little. There are no nails in that at all. They just kind of hook in in there. But if you go to uh, the um, uh, to the Library of Congress, a Habs drawing of uh, is 1436 Parker Street. Thank you. I heard the masters would set up tarps around them so no one could watch them work and steal their secrets. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, there's a family of plasterers who is pretty much well known for how they started arches. And uh, so if you worked uh, in that family, who I won't say their name, uh, but if you worked in that family um, on the days that they started their arches, uh, they would only allow uh, their nephews and sons or whatever uh, uh, inside the, uh, they, they would use like sheets, they would put kind of sheets around. For many of you who are from New Orleans, you may remember there was a building called the Rivergate uh, down where the uh, Harris Casino is now. And um, that was really funny the last time that that was like a real big issue. Uh, they had to uh, bring in uh, like a lot of families of plasterers to complete that. I think they initially tried to start that with like union plasterers from out of state or whatever because they didn't know what they were doing. So then they had to uh, bring in like all these different families. And so when this family was doing their arches, they literally put sheets up around uh, their work so that <laughs> no one would know how they started their uh, arches. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. How many apprentices are currently working with the Guild? Right now, like I said, we uh, our funding was down the last uh, year and a half. Uh, we only have three right now, but you know we uh, had been up to six or seven is what we like to work with uh, in the trades. So in the two trades. Thank you. You know what we're trying to do, by the way, uh, as I say all the time, you get what you pay for. So mm -hmm. a lot of programs, training programs that do entry level training, they have what's called uh, what we call like the thirteen weeks uh, and a cloud of dust kind of a thing where they get people, you know, pretty much off the streets who have no skills whatsoever, training for 13 weeks, and pretty much they know how to uh, name all the tools or whatever, and then they kick them out, and uh, they become um, laborers, literally, and that's pretty much all they do, they know. In our program, we compress what used to be three-year apprenticeships into like one year, and then uh, the people who have the most, um, uh, promise after that are then hired on uh, uh, or hired out uh, to continue their training. So, uh, you know, our thing is we would rather do six or eight people a year over the course of 10 years to produce 60 bona fide master craftsmen than to produce, uh, you know, uh, 300 uh, laborers uh, in that same amount of time who, you know, proficient at carrying work for other people. Thank you. I, I heard you say a lot um, 
we're referring to Daryl Reeves, we, when we're talking about project development, we did this and we did that. So I'm wondering how involved are you in the development process? Like, are you ever like physically involved with assisting him? Um, so I, I just wanted to know how we're involved because you know very intimately how things are put together and the inner workings of it. So I wanted to know how involved are you in, in, in these processes for different projects? Well, it's almost just the opposite of the way you described it. Uh, the, <laughs> so the weird part of it, in it is that I tried to not get in the way of the physical operations of things. As the guys are always saying, Mr. John, put that down. You know, Mr. John, get out of the way. Uh, and certainly I tried not to lift anything because uh, I'm old as dirt. <laughs> However, uh, when I say we, a lot of the times uh, I negotiate the, um, uh, uh, in, you know, the contacts uh, with uh, uh, people and uh, also uh, uh, try to provide a, um, shall we say, uh, support for the apprentices. Because in addition to uh, teaching uh, the skills, apprenticeships are, is more like uh, teaching people how to become uh, a, you know, a, uh, a professional master craftsman. So a lot of that uh, is, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 like the hands-on skills and then a lot of it is soft skills. And so I'm primarily more on the soft skills side. Thank you. So I think you kind of answered one of the questions. What is your personal specialty in the historic building world? I kind of hinted at that. Um, <laughs> um, you know, what the guys say is that they are the doers and I'm the talkers. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny. You said, Mr. Hankins, please don't don't touch that. <laughs> yeah, they always uh, pick up stuff there, like Mr. John, put that down. <laughs> I mean, even the women, like, don't, don't do that. <laughs> so funny. Okay, so are there any records accessible to the public uh, with ledgers, rosters of members in any uh, and other history of a select trade unions like the Bricklayers Union Hall? Interested uh, as I researched the Nabone family and many others who were in the tree. Well, uh, I mean, there are a lot of different uh, primary sources of records, but there are a lot of obstacles to doing the research. Uh, if you're talking about like early uh, 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 18th and 19th century records, they're in French and then they're in French script at that. Uh, you know, the indenture records, one volume of them in the Louisiana collection has been translated into English during the WPA, but for the large part, a lot of that stuff is in French. Uh, the other thing is that the unions uh, have been decimated uh, in Louisiana. One of the reasons for the need for something like the uh, New Orleans Craft Guild is that the union apprenticeship programs have been decimated. This follows like a generation and a half of loss of training uh, that began in the 1970s and 80s when vocational education was stripped out of the public schools. New Orleans used to have one of the most robust and uh, you know most widely admired uh, vocational programs in the country. And it was just shocked uh, when it was decided that everybody should be on a college track. And of course we know Everybody doesn't go to college. And so that pipeline into the trades got really cut off from the uh, vocational training uh, programs being cut out of schools. And then uh, uh, Louisiana, especially in the 80s, became much more of a right to work state. And other than unions that are affiliated with uh, like government defense contracts and things like that, like the uh, shipyards, which have now moved, um, uh, there are very few apprenticeship programs. There is a, a, a driving apprenticeship program in carpentry uh, and, um, and brick masonry. And that's why we chose to go into uh, historic uh, preservation trades of plastering and ironwork. Thank you so much. Next question. Could you please speak about your research process into the lives and works of enslaved uh, master craftspeople? 
What sources do you consult and how do you follow these experts while they were enslaved? Well, the, um, uh, it's very interesting. Um, primarily, uh, what we have done is, uh, I guess the primary research that we have done has been to uh, review the indenture records. Uh, that is uh, the apprenticeship records that are, uh, let me back up a little bit. In order to be an apprentice uh, in antebellum uh, New Orleans, you, uh, your family, if you were under 21, your family had to enter into a contract, generally up to about three years with a master craftsman. They then provided like uh, pretty much training, uh, food, uh, sometimes board, but mostly just food and some education up to, you know, just the uh, ability to do math and stuff like that. They used to say up to the third level, it's like third grade. Uh, and any money that was passed actually went to your parents. But those contracts are on records. You know, Louisiana kept records of everything. So a lot of that process uh, are in the, um, the indenture records of the, um, they're housed in the uh, main library, the Louisiana collection, the main library. Uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, you know, in the last, 30 years has been a lot of research, especially uh, well, since uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Gwendolyn Midlow Hall has kind of revolutionized the way that we look at uh, slavery in Louisiana. So there's been a lot of, of, of people doing research on uh, the enslaved people who were brought here into Louisiana. For instance, her research in uh, she actually provided me, and now it's online, she provided like a hundred uh, like CD-ROM discs to me of uh, uh, the descriptions of the enslaved people who were brought here, 108,000 records, uh, which uh, notated things like their African names, what part of the continent they were from, what tribal groups they were from, what skills they had, what their physical conditions were, where they were shipped to, what plantation uh, they were sold to, what they uh, were sold for, and what work they were, did. So we, the primary sources that are available, uh, but then there's just been a lot of research like the research of Dr. Hall. Thank you. Next question. Have you thought about bringing your book Raised to the Trade, Creole Building Arts of New Orleans back to print? I would love to because if you go online right now and try to buy a used copy of it, the prices range from a couple of hundred dollars. So uh, last week, my son and I were looking at $960 for uh, copies of that book. So um, the uh, New, uh, New Orleans Museum of Art does hold the rights to the book, uh, but I'm sure that uh, we could get it reprinted if we uh, uh, got the um, got funding to do that. So yes, we have thought about it. Thank you. But in the meantime, if you have a copy of it, hold on to it. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's going to be worth it gets it is worth now. I it's, mean, I'm about to say it's I think about all those copies I gave away and now I can get nine hundred dollars for them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, that book is uh, uh, it. Uh, I think it uh, it has appreciated so much because it won the um, uh, Philip Johnson Award for the uh, uh, Book of the Year from the Association of, of Historic Architects uh, back in 2006 or something like that, 2005. Uh, and then it has been used by various preservation programs around the country. I know like in Arkansas every year for uh, their people uh, and their preservation program, they use it as a text. Uh, and so it just sold out real quick. Awesome. Last question for the evening. Why does the wood between brick wall building process not have the wood portion rot? Well, because a lot of the wood that they use was cypress. And uh, cypress wood is kind of impervious to uh, water and to insects. And that's why it was used. 
Thank you. Also, for the most part, until very recently, it was all encased in plaster. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it didn't really, it wasn't exposed to uh, elements. And there are a lot of little tricks. If you know anything about those buildings, whoever's asking me about that, mm -hmm. they'll know that uh, even still, there are a lot of little tricks that the uh, carpenters and the framers used to keep uh, termites out of the buildings. But um, as uh, Tudor Montana, who was a lateral say, I ain't telling you what they are. You got to join our game to learn that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, and I guess one more question, we have time for it. Who initially taught the enslaved people the ironwork skills? Did it originate from Spanish, Germans, or French? Oh, boy. Do you, this must be your question because this is a setup. <laughs> you should go to the Gallier House today and look at the exhibition, Artistry and Iron. And then you will find that Africans were forging iron for centuries before they ever were enslaved by Europeans. And uh, especially the Africans that were brought to uh, Louisiana, who were from the Bight of Africa, from uh, the, uh, you know, what is now Benin, uh, that whole area, uh, now Cameroon and, um, I guess now part of Nigeria. But uh, short answer is the Africans uh, passed that along for like centuries and the uh, blacksmiths in those uh, tribal areas were uh, held up as like, you know, pretty much a, a spiritual people also because they were able to infuse the spirit into the metal. And the, the metal, even metal that was used for cooking and things like that, had to have the blessings of uh, blacksmiths. But uh, no, uh, you know, some of the techniques uh, obviously were taught by some of the Europeans, so to fit their particular stylistic, uh, you know, desires. But blacksmithing itself has been practiced on the African continent for a thousand years. Thank you so much. That's all. Go to the Gallier House, right? Yes, Gallier House. <laughs> there are panels that tell you the history of that. They trace Absolutely. The history of that. So yes, we, we keep referencing it, but it really is artistry and iron. It really is a fantastic um, exhibit on um, the iron workers of New Orleans. Um, at Gallier House, we're open from 9.30 to 3.30. Um, Friday through Monday. And so uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hankins. You did an amazing, first of all, it was a, an amazing presentation. You're very knowledgeable about all of this stuff. All of this stuff is just like so fascinating to me. Um, and I hope it was to you all as well that, I mean, <sighs> I'm taken aback by all of the, the area of expertise when it comes to that. Um, and even for those of you who um, come to, we also have our urban enslavement tour um, and we do have um, wonderful uh, sort of architectural features like the freeze um, that we have at Herman Grima um, that would have likely been done by uh, an enslaved or a free person of color, um, master uh, crafts uh, person. And so- um, uh, Dr. Scott, if I could just say, if you go to the exhibition there, you'll also be able to recognize like African symbols, like Adinkra symbols that are all over the French Quarter, including the spires at the top of the uh, St. Louis Cathedral are Sankofa symbols from the Akan tribe uh, in Ghana. Uh, and, uh, you know, the archdiocese knows that they're there and now you do too. <laughs> but you'll see the uh, uh, symbols that you'll notice in the ironwork throughout the quarter that actually uh, are centuries old in answer to that question about who taught the Africans. Right. The Africans might have taught <laughs> a mm -hmm. lot of, you know, well, I won't go there. But <laughs> in any case, uh, the stuff that's very pleasing that you'll find uh, throughout the quarter uh, is all over uh, Western Central Africa. So it came with the enslaved people here, the design. Thank you, Thank you all so much. Um, 
So um, I will bid you all good night. Thank you so much, uh, John. I will be in touch after this. Um, but uh, wonderful presentation. You're so very knowledgeable. Thank you for taking the time to um, share share this with us. My pleasure. <laughs> all right. Much. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us again and stay tuned. We have so much more in store for you all.